Good evening, everyone. We're a little late. We're trying. We're waiting for a couple of legislators, but I think that we'll start without them, and uh, they'll come. I would like everybody around the table to introduce themselves in case there's somebody in the. Uh, I guess I'd call you the audience. <laughs> in case we don't know each other, so I'll start. I'm Joan Petner of Longmont. Aaron Rodriguez, City Council. Shakita Yabrell, City Council. Marsha Martin, City Council. Sean McCoy, City Council. Valerie Dodd, next slide. Christina Pacheco, Director of Human Services. Becky Doyle, uh, Director of Strategic Integration, representing utilities today. Jamie Roth, Deputy City Attorney. Joni Marsh, Assistant City Manager for uh, External Services. And Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager for Internal Services. Susie Zaldo Farring, uh, City Council. And Representative Karen McCormick, House District 11, which is the bulk of Longmont. Uh, Representative Jennifer Parenti, House District 19, which is the rest of Longmont, East of Pace. <laughs> so we're waiting for uh, Senator um, Hawkes Lewis and uh, Kyle Carter. Which we don't get to say about senators. So we're going to start with uh, first of all, thank you everybody who came to uh, witness this. And if you have comments, there will be hopefully at the end time for uh, comments from you. Um, so let's start with our agenda says we are going to have the 2023 legislative up initiatives from our representatives and senators. So unfortunately you're eating I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry done. about that. I'm not chewing. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to start then? I, um, what exactly do, you, do we want to hear? Do you want to what hear what I'm working on? Yes, okay. absolutely. Because it's, it's easier for me to talk about what I'm working on versus what everybody else is working on. And I happen to be chair of the House Agriculture, Water, and Natural Resources Committee, which as you can imagine, the scope of the things that come to us, we are focused on water, um, the future of water in our state, uh, how we deal with a hotter, drier climate. We are engaged with um, the agricultural industry in our state, which um, is a big part in Boulder County um, that, that uh, some of us are not aware of, and how we work with our other upper basin states um, in partnership with our lower basin states on um, the crisis of the Colorado River. So there's a lot of discussion happening in that space. Um, I'm also working on some areas of potential innovation in the use of biochar, which is a, a carbon solid that is produced under high pressure and high temperature of biomass, particularly uh, pine beetle kill, but it can be many other sorts of bio um, biomass, and it its uh, its structure is closer to a diamond than it is to charcoal, but it looks like charcoal. So many of you may be familiar with biochar, many of you may not. But the the excitement is to look at the possibility of the use of biochar and building that up as a new economic driver for our state, a new. Um, uh, area of industry development. We have a few biochar uh, producers in our state. One is just north of us here in Weld County. I recommend everybody go visit. It's called Biochar Now. But what we're looking at is the possibility of using biochar as a permanent carbon sink, permanently taking carbon out of the carbon cycle, which over the last century and a half, we've put a lot more carbon in the carbon cycle that the natural cycle has been able to continue to remove. Um, and so finding a way to permanently sink carbon in the plugging of abandoned oil and gas wells, which are happening uh, throughout our state. And you know, as they are exhausted, they need to be plugged. And currently they're using um, different products uh, that are concrete type products but then there's, there's a concrete flood at the top and the bottom, and then there's a spacer in between that typically is, used, is filled with a type of slurry that 
will have bentonite clay and other things in it. It just has to reach a certain pressure uh, within that um, well to meet federal standards. So we are um, <coughs> conducting or, or starting a study, uh, directing a study to be done to find out um, if biochar has the capacity to be used in this in this area. Uh, does it have the bio mechanical properties, the geochemical properties, uh, the longevity, all the things that people way smarter than me need to, need to figure out. And so we're partnering with, with CSU to do that first part of the study. Pretty exciting. Um, it did get a lot of national attention the last couple of weeks because we would be the first state in the nation to look at that possibility and if if it turns out that that's a real thing that has scientific backing, then the next step would be to take it out in the field to do a field pilot study, because you know you don't want to just do it without incremental steps. And then that field study would be under the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission to house that study, again with guardrails there, to find out is this going to work in the field. And those those abandoned wells will, will be chosen not in all one area because our geological makeup of Colorado is different so many other places we would want to. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the exciting things. It just got through um, the Energy and Environment Committee um, and it's um, waiting for a price tag to be put on it. Um, and then after that, of course, it has to go to appropriations and then we decide if, if there's um, if we have any discretionary money to spend this year in the budget, because you all know we have to balance the budget every year, and um, some things get through, some things don't. Um, I am on the water space. We are looking with the Department of Natural Resources and all the people in the water arena. That's all water users, water rights, ag, municipal, recreational users, conservation people to, as, as we all know in Colorado, our snow bank is our water reservoir. We cannot go to a large um, reservoir like Lake Mead or Lake Powell and say, hey, we need some more water, turn on the spigot, like the lower basin states can do. We depend on Mother Nature gives us snow and then we live within our means. The lower basin states have a checking account and a savings account and they have been overdrawing their checking account and overdrawing their savings account and um, potentially looking to us and we have been living with our needs and so we want to look at ways where we can actually potentially shore up a second uh, snow bank in a way uh, where we can restore rivers and streams um, it's, it's called stream restoration to back to their natural historic footprint uh, help these riparian areas that have been able to like be a sponge for that melt off and, and have it slower delivered slower into the system so that we have our um, backup and our storage um, in a you know because most of our storage is natural storage but that's that's an exciting thing that's still being in the works and coming forward and there's a lot more, but I think I'll stop there because there's a lot of people that need to talk, and then we can we can circle back. So thank you very much. So we'll go with representative Gordon. Thank you. So uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Jennifer Parenti. I represent House <coughs> District 19, which, as we said, it covers the eastern portion of Longmont, so everything east of Pace, but then I have everything to the east and the south of you. So Erie, Frederick, Firestone, Decono, unincorporated Boulder County to 95th Avenue. Uh, this is my first year in the legislature. legislature. Um, I am also on the Agriculture, Water, and Natural Resources Committee. Because it's the best committee. It is the best committee. <laughs> uh, with Representative McCormick, I'm also on the Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Committee, which I'm really excited about because of housing is such an important issue for our district. Uh, and I'm also on the Joint Technology Committee, so I've got oversight over the major IT programs of the state. I'm a software engineer by trade, so I was excited to get that appointment. Um, things that we've been working on, um, a lot of my early part of the legislation was actually tied up in Joint Technology Committee. 
looking at those information technology projects, making sure that we are really working hard to get broadband better deployed in our state, to um, open up the possibility for municipalities, as Longmont has done, to tap into local broadband as, um, as, a, as a utility. There are lots of federal dollars coming down in that space that municipalities can tap into, and so I really encourage you to look into that and where you have um, eligibility. That's gonna be exciting to see over the next couple of years, but particularly for our rural areas where we really need it and particularly in the um, native uh, on the reservations um, other things that I've been working on like the rest of the legislature very focused on housing affordable housing um, there are a number of bills going through the legislature in this space um, I partnered on two bills that are sort of ancillary related to this area with other members of the legislature I um, are working on a, an HOA and Metro District Task Force with a representative to tone this. If it passes through both chambers and, and the governor's office, we'll establish a task force to meet later this year to look really deeply into HOAs, how they're working in our state, Metro Districts, how they're working in our state, and look for opportunities to ensure that we are of course, creating a, a, a safe and friendly business climate, but also focusing on consumer protections. Mm -hmm. So some of those things that we're looking at are disclosure, notifications, conflicts of interest, you know, of board members, um, and, and making sure that ultimately when someone enters into a home contract, which is you know what we do when we buy our homes, that they really understand exactly what all of those um, mechanisms are before they sign the dotted line. Um, I'm also very uh, interested in uh, ethical and accountable transparent government. So I've got a couple of bills I'm working on in that space. Um, I am working on a bill with Representative Story from Jefferson County on getting our school districts and our special districts accountable under our ethical um, uh, behavior laws in the state by law right now they are they are they, they are supposed to follow the law but there exists no enforcement body for them and kind of a loophole in how the law the law was written so uh, we're going to try to bring special districts and school districts under the oversight of Colorado's independent ethics commission so we're happy to do that uh, just to give members of the public another opportunity uh, if they feel like there's conflicts of interest or other inappropriate behavior happening. Um, I'm also really interested in public safety. We're going to be working on some bills in that space. I'm going to let Senator Hawkins Lewis um, talk about her flagship bill in that area, but I'm very happy to be co-sponsoring that with her. So I'm going to stop there and just leave it mostly to Q&A, but again, I'm very happy to be here and um, thank you for being concerned and engaged citizens. Yes. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I will stand also, I think, so everybody can hear me. Um, I don't know, is this a recording or? It's, it's, it's recording. recording. Okay. <laughs> Do I need to come up this way then? Oh, there we go. Okay, great. I'm in the dual vision then. Um, hi, everyone. Sonia Hawkins Lewis. I live um, just south of Longmont and I am your state senator. I represent Longmont, Erie, and uh, Lafayette. Uh, it encompasses Eastern Boulder County, Western Wells County, and a little sliver of Broomfield, where not too many people live. Um, I took the list that Sandy sent out of all the issues that you were interested in us talking about and what we were doing, and so I, came up with a list of the bills that match that area, and it just so happens that I have many on the on that list. I think that may mean that I'm representing the city council in a way that you would like, but let me try to go over some of those. Um, so your city council sent me a list of issues, law enforcement reforms are, is was one of the areas. Um, 
we have several bills going on there. Uh, probably the biggest one is motor vehicle theft. It's Senate Bill 97. That is a, a bill to increase uh, the penalties if you steal a car. It's, uh, I think it's very important. Colorado leads the country in car thefts right now, so that we just put that as a very important bill. Uh, there is a <coughs> DNA testing bill. There's um, uh, bills around indecent exposure. Uh, so there are definitely some law enforcement reforms. I don't have anything in that area. I'm a pharmacist by training, not a lawyer. So I leave some of those up to the lawyers in the uh, Senate and in the House. Uh, the other area that you were interested in is housing. That is huge this year. I am the Senate Chair of Housing and Local Government. Um, we have over 30 bills uh, that we are going to be working on, and you heard a, a little bit about that. Um, affordable housing is probably in the top three issues for our session. I am working with the majority leader of the Senate on a land uh, land zoning uh, bill. It, it has several sections to it. It's a very large bill. Uh, it, the entire section on ADUs is actually lifted from Longmont because Longmont leads the state in uh, accessible dwelling units. Your, your policy is better than some of the policies that we've looked at from around the country. So we hope that we can take the best practices from Longmont and spread them to the rest of the state. Uh, there will be tenant rights issues. I am doing a, um, a bill that will allow someone before they're evicted, when they have the hearing, they'll be able to do it remotely. Uh, we know a lot of people can't just get up and leave their jobs during the day. So we are going to be making remote testimony accessible. Uh, there is a first right of refusal bill that I think that the city council would be very interested in. It's House Bill 1190. For those that don't already know what that bill is, it allows a local municipality or a local um, governmental agency to have the first right on a property to purchase it for affordable housing. Um, there are bills. There are bills around. Um, there are bills around uh, looking at rent stabilization. There are bills around uh, in <coughs> Louisville. There are 72 areas in the Marshall Fire Fire Zone. 72 units uh, where the families have decided not to come back. They don't want to come back. And those lots are sitting vacant in the middle of that of those uh, subdivisions. So we are looking at are there creative ways to do more multifamily, more affordable housing in those areas. Um, I will keep going. On uh, preschool, that was one of the areas that you had listed. Uh, because free preschool started now in January, uh, there's probably not too many bills coming around preschool. Um, that this will be the first time in the history of Colorado that you have free, basically free preschool for kids to sign up. So the sign up was starting in January, and I believe some of that has been extended. Um, Climate change was one of the areas that you sent to me. Senate Bill 16 uh, is a huge bill by yeah, Senator. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Senator Chris Hansen. And he already spoke on it, so I won't. I did not. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a very, in my opinion, it's the, one of the most important bills that we're going to be looking at. Um, it is stuck right now, right? In Crooks for Senate. Finance. Has a, it has a, yeah. Senate finance. Yes, that's right. Senate Finance and then approach. Um, maybe I should let you talk about. I'll keep yeah, going. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> uh, the reason why I think it's one of the most important bills is that Senator Hansen and Brett McCormick have divided climate change areas uh, into into various sections that we can tackle, and um, 
I think that that was a smart approach to doing it. And I, I think I will let you do the guts of it, but do you want, well, do you want to do it now? Yeah, well, well. I'll, I'll add a little bit more. You know, of course, any bill, I'm just freezing, so I'm like wrapped in my blanket. Um, any bill that starts in one house, one side, or chamber, or the other, um, can change quite significantly before it actually gets over to my, our side or your side. Um, and so that this bill was constructed last year and did not get through on the last day of session for a variety of reasons, not because of the bill. And so it's basically the same bill as last year and it does put um, interim targets that um, the Colorado Energy Office had set in their last greenhouse gas reduction roadmap. Um, but in order to hit those larger, like 10 year targets, it puts interim targets in there. So we have a better, better stepping stones, I guess, to get to where we're going and um, addresses the area of um, incentivizing small uh, gas powered engines like lawn mowers for retailers to be able to have a tax credit um, applied to their back to them um, if they sell a product to an individual that individual will get the discount the the, um, the owner of the shop will get the tax credit and so um, and they projected that will save quite a those those small engines actually produce quite a bit of um, some of the, the gases that we don't want in the air and the electric forms um, are coming out more and more and often are the price is a lot less. So we're trying to just drive that in a market-based approach to get people to transition to those. Um, it also has some um, guidelines for our public employees retirement fund to be doing what many um, funds across the nation are doing looking at i forget the neck the name of the national insurance um, uh, kind of actuarial study people are but to look at the risk value of where you're putting your money for instance if you're buying a lot of um, see, you know, uh, beachside property, um, what is the long-term value of that beachside property um, and what will it do to your portfolio? So that's, that's kind of an extreme example, but to look at those sorts of things um, uh, so that people's money that's getting invested really has the homework behind it to make sure their long-term investment is solid mm -hmm. with the things that are changing those investments. Um, I know I'm forgetting some things. There is oh, there's, there's a part in there that will help um, <clears throat> uh, facilitate the, uh, the energy, the electric lines that we have, the transmission lines, to um, be able to utilize what we have um, in a way, so when they get upgraded, they're upgraded in a way that will able to um, be more resilient in for our grid so there's there's language in there for that um, I think it has like 13 sections so um, it's a good one to follow or, or to go read up on it's Senate Bill 16 and um, I look forward to it um, coming over and see what see what's still in there when it <laughs> when it gets gets over to the house and, and that that Rep McCormick brings up a really good point the um, the fiscal note on that bill, um, we don't have the revenue that we've had in the past. Last year, we had really hundreds of millions of dollars that we were able to put into homelessness, mental health, education, community safety, so many different areas, healthcare. We don't have that money anymore. That was coming from federal dollars. So now many bills are excellent ideas, but we don't know how we're going to fund them yet. And so they're sitting, waiting until we can figure that out. And Senate Bill 16 is one of those. Um, there's other ones on climate crisis. Uh, I have one. It's uh, an expansion to the CPACE program. That is our Colorado um, commercial and industrial efficiencies program. So if you have a 
commercial building that is not very uh, energy efficient, we can do a, a private public partnership to help get those efficiencies so when they expand, uh, we can help improve so that we're using less energy, uh, uh, more sustainable. Uh, it's a very successful program. It's in over 40 state, 40 counties in this uh, state. Uh, the most recent was El Paso County, where they did an improvement to the U.S. Olympic um, training area. So uh, we were able to do an expansion on that. Um, and uh, we have, oh gosh, um, forest fire detection, uh, ozone, um, looking at ozone uh, flexibility. Local governments can identify their high peak uh, ozone area and they can, we can do things around incre uh, increasing public transportation. Uh, I have an uh, oil and gas bill. We have two oil and gas bills. One is the one that you heard Brett McCormick talk about with biochar, uh, very important. The one I have is a property rights for mineral resources bill um, right now. If you, uh, if Boulder County has the mineral rights on a large open space, this will give them the flexibility to have more say so. Uh, right now, they have, they can be lumped in with uh, a few other owners, and they will have no control over the uh, mineral rights. So that's something that is going to be introduced soon. Um, you had asked about workers' comp. It's not a big issue this session. Um, we have, we do have a workers' comp uh, expansion from 12 weeks to 36 weeks. If you have a, if you're categorized in a certain uh, mental impairment because of whatever the accident was, so that's the only one I can find on workers' comp. We have a huge bill around forest fire destruction and property insurance. Yeah, and then, insurance. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and that is Senator Fenberg and Bob Yeah. Um, recycling, we have a couple of really interesting bills coming out. We have uh, Senate Bill 50, which is around things that are, are should be more labeled better so that they're not thrown in the right place. I'm working on a composting bill. We just learned this week that the largest composting company in Colorado is now going to refuse many of the items in composting. And uh, Senator Cutter and myself have put in a late bill request to try to address that, to stop that from happening, try to give them some of the resources, some things we can do. We don't know if we're going to get that request, but um, it, it sent shockwaves out across the, the uh, uh, Senate and the House mm -hmm. because so many people are composting now and we need to encourage them. Um, HOAs, one of our favorite top topics at the Capitol, you asked about HOAs. I happen to have an HOA bill that Rep. McCormick is helping me with. We think it's a very smart HOA bill because it's around saving water. If you live in an HOA and you want to pull up your front yard and, and change that to more zero scape plants, this will give you the flexibility to do that. There, we've had bills in the past that allow for some of that, but what's happening is um, designs and HOA requirements are, are a little bit complex and getting in the way. And we think we have found an excellent way to streamline. We've, uh, HOA, we've met a lot of stakeholding the HOA uh, uh, association is happy with where we have the bill. We believe we're going to save a lot of water with this because a lot of the grasses that people have planted use up a lot of water. Um, so we're we're doing great on that. Uh, you didn't ask about health care and as a pharmacist I think it's you know pretty high up there. So we have some very impressive bills. The first one is Senate Bill 93. It's about medical debt. So if you are getting ready to have a procedure, an elective surgery, or you're in an emergency, you're in a car accident, or you've been, been diagnosed with cancer, those are the um, just absolutely, it's the lar largest bankruptcy reason in the state of Colorado is medical debt. What this bill does is if you, you will get 
instantly or if it's an emergency situation, your family member uh, will get an estimated cost of what your treatment's going to be. And that helps you plan for it. It lets you know what your costs are going to be. And if you're a self-pay um, person, meaning you don't have insurance through either the Colorado Exchange or through your employer, they have to give even more details because you're going to be on the hook for those that money. And in Colorado, it can be thousands and thousands of dollars. If you have, if you know anyone as a pharmacist, I know, unfortunately, way too many people that have been diagnosed with cancer, and they are. Many people have had to sell their homes to afford the treatment to survive uh, that kind of diagnosis. Well, now. What we've designed is if you go in to medical debt and you're getting uh, debt collectors coming to you, there's a new standard of conduct so that you are not harassed so much with the phone calls. There is a new uh, procedure on what you will be given, the information that you will be given because it's very confusing. You can have a doctor, you can have a radiologist, you can have a surgeon, you can have so many different bills coming at you. Um, and we're capping the medical debt interest rate at 3% so that you can actually make a plan to pay back the money for the services that you are going to receive. We feel like this is huge for allowing people to hang on to their homes. So it's a very, very big bill. We've had, the only people that are really opposed to it are the debt collectors. But we'll see, we'll see if we can overcome those hurdles. Uh, prescription drugs still are out of control. Prescription drug prices. The um, America pays the most of any country in the world for prescription drugs. So we are expanding. Colorado did a very historic thing two years ago, and I'm proud to say I was the, the lead uh, legislator on that. We now have an affordability review board that will look at the affordability of the price of that drug and see if we can afford it. And if we can't afford it, then we issue an upper payment limit. Now, you can imagine the pharmaceutical manufacturers were not happy with that bill. We were, again, first in the country to do this. So they got some amendments on it to limit us to 12 drugs. So this year, we are going to lift that limit. And we are going to try to get control of some of the cost of these drugs by putting affordability of repayment limits on it. Uh, the last one I'll talk about is very big. It's a mental health bill. I'm lucky to be working on it with Senator Marchman, who is the newly elected Senator for Boulder County and Loveland. And this bill doesn't cost us a dime. She has identified as a teacher that there are mental health therapists that are licensed in Colorado by Dora, but they're not allowed to practice in the schools because they don't have a piece of paper from the Department of Education. And this allows them to register very quickly, to be able to be qualified to go into the schools, and we anticipate that we will be able to get more mental health therapists for kids in crisis as quick as we can, and it's not going to cost the state a dime. So I thank Senator Marchman for coming up with this idea, and I'm glad to be on it. And I could probably go on and on about health care, so I'm going to stop, but I'm happy to, I don't know what the format is, but I'm happy to take questions. I think that's the last topic. Yeah. What do we do? I was looking at your list. I'm like, oh, I can do pesticides. Oh, yeah, pesticides. <laughs> we can do that. Um, and also, just to follow up on health care, I'm also on the health and insurance committee in the House. And there was a really interesting bill that went through this week, week which um, I learned something about. And um, it's about uh, pharmacy dispensing machines. And you think, what? <laughs> that sounds really not good. Um, but there, there are nationwide, other states are utilizing these in conjunction. And I know Senator Hawkins is, is a pharmacist with a live pharmacist for people to be able to get their prescriptions when the actual pharmacy is closed, but perhaps the, the um, store is still open. Mm -hmm. 
where um, they're incredibly secure, like they're more secure than ATMs, apparently, these things. And that you have to, um, ha there's a 24 hour pharmacist available online. They, there's a whole company that does that. Um, what was so fascinating was learning about the bill and and its ability to for people to get their medications on a Saturday or at 6.15 when the pharmacy closes. Or at 3 o'clock in the morning when you just left the ER. Yeah. Things yeah. like that. Yeah. And um, so we're sitting there as a committee. The first step is you get the bill presented. Well, of course, you, you have it ahead of time to read and to ask questions. But there were no people testifying for or against this bill. I thought this is really fascinating that um, that it's apparently that bland of an idea that nobody showed up. Um, there was discussion on the on the House floor, but that got unanimous support in our bipartisan committee. Um, it will be heading over to the Senate. Fascinating idea, very innovative and exciting, and again, increases access to care, which is what we're all trying to do. Um, pesticides is on this list, which is fascinating. Um, I, spent, I spent an hour and a half on a Zoom call this afternoon, and I also spent a whole entire day last summer, I called it pesticide tour, I was on a pesticide tour, um, because this year the Pesticide Applicators Act is up for renewal, which under the Department of Regulatory Agencies, they review professions every 10 or 11 years, Veterinary Practice Act was just done last year, which was very near and dear to my heart because I'm a veterinarian. Um, and so this year, the Pesticide Applicators Act, it, which has to do with the licensing of, of being able to achieve your Applicators Act. So it really doesn't have uh, to do with the pesticides themselves, but it's about um, the procedures that folks have to go through the continuing education they have to do, the record keeping that they have to do to be an applicator. It's getting a lot of attention though because it has the word pesticides in it, um, but it's really a regulatory um, thing that has to be done, otherwise we will not have um, legal pesticide applicators. And believe you me, we want them to be trained um, for public safety and the, the utilization of um, these products in open space and parks. I've heard a lot of great things about Longmont, by the way, when I was on that tour. Um, for our nurseries, like if you go to the tree farm, we, we went there on the tour, um, as well as just your lawn, your lawn people. There, there was way more education and training that they have to go through than I even realized. So that is getting some discussion right now. It's in the Senate. Um, and they're looking at some potential um, changes to that that have to do with people that might be on the um, sensitivity list so, so that if you have a, a medical doctor's um, diagnosis of having a pesticide sensitivity, there's there, apparently there's only 90 people registered in our state that fall into that category, but if you're one of the 90, that's pretty important. Um, so they're looking at ways for those people to potentially not only register where they live, but where they go to school and where they work because it's that critical to their health. Um, and so that's, that's being discussed as well as the proximity to where that person may be um, is also up for review. So um, I don't know if that's what you want to know about pesticides, but it's kind of big in the discussion uh, in, in the Capitol about the Applicators Act coming up for renewal, so. Great, yeah. we've got that covered. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so thank you to our representatives and senators, um, that was great. Um, I do want to bring attention to the people at this table. I did, are they out in the, everybody got these? Uh, everybody at the, uh, all elected officials. Okay, so it's posted on the city's website as well. Right, well, what this is is the city council statement on legislate, legislation affecting public safety. Um, it's pretty lengthy, so I don't know that I'm going to read it right now, um, but it is on our website. Under longmontcolorado.gov, go to departments, go to the city council and city council members, and you will find the statement. 
So I'm going to open it up right now to the officials and staff sitting around this table. So our uh, officials and can answer all these questions. Oh, yeah. Sure, smart questions. Okay. And Mayor, I should note for the City Council that uh, Senate Bill 16 is being reviewed, reviewed by CC48 right now, and that's why we're waiting to bring that to you. So that's why you haven't seen it yet, because I can see you're like, why haven't we seen this one? Mm -hmm. Senate 48 is reviewing it right now. It's good. Sorry. Yes. That's the point that. of paper. Here, 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 here. 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 So I, I'll open it up to um, counselors. Do you have questions or comments for our representatives? Are we just understand so all of that whole line? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take what Senator you're doing very right seriously. You got off early. You make all of us look bad. <laughs> no, but I, I well, yes, but next week we've been in planning for, we have I'm to save say, bills. We got our plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you got out early tonight because they know next week's going to be very good. That's really yeah. marathon. Mm -hmm. It'll be a marathon. Mm -hmm. well, I have a question. Okay, great. Um, you, uh, Representative McCormick, you talked about water. So within our community, we are a growing community as most of Boulder County is. What would you say uh, would be the number one issue with uh, making sure that we have enough water for? the amount of people coming in and moving into Boulder County, especially into Longmont. Well, from what I know about Longmont's fantastic planning from the past is that Longmont had the foresight to project out growth till, what, 2050 or beyond, and got all of the, the storage rights in place for quite a bit more growth. Um, so good for Longmont, but we're we're the whole state, and you know we I represent Longmont, but with us we have the name on our name tag is state representative. So so um, very proud of what Longmont has done for planning for future growth. But even the reservoirs that we depend upon, if the western slope water that comes our way over here to the eastern slope that helps us all out is diminished we still need to have um, the ability to plan for that future that does not fit the past um, projections and we just came out statewide water plan the updated water plan just came out about three weeks ago which has a tremendous amount i would encourage everyone to get a copy of maybe i'll bring you a copy of that it's not very big um, that has many of the different innovative ideas, not just for storage, but for um, conservation, for efficiency projects. And that plan, of course, needs a tremendous amount of resources statewide to fund and to, to distribute to the um, counties and municipalities that kind of get on the list of needs of projects that needs to be done. So if Longmont has a list of water projects that have some kind of prioritization um, it's important to kind of look at it it already came out this year but to look forward on yeah we have a water project that we want some funding for because the other important thing is to know that the inflation reduction act and the infrastructure um, and jobs act from the federal government ha has set aside quite a bit just for drought res resiliency, um, contingency planning, and storage, specifically for the western states, because they see, if you look at a map of from the, the national weather folks, we are smack dab in the middle of the hottest, like right where we are in the western slope is like red orange of the entire nation. Like we are getting the hottest, the driest, fastest. And so, um, so the water plan is a good place to look to see how can Longmont specifically um, look at some of those ideas um, and then move to get some of those matching dollars. And this, this could be, you know, 
five year, five to ten year plan, but um, that the first water plan came out with Governor Hickenlooper in 2015 and has not been updated since until just now. And they spent over a year going statewide to communities and um, counties to get input from everybody on the updated water plan. So um, hopefully I answered your question, but I, I am proud of Longmont because Longmont somehow years ago had the foresight to plan ahead and that's um, incredibly smart. So for those of you who want to look at that plan, you can go to cwcb.colorado.gov forward slash Colorado dash water dash plan and look at that water plan. But I, on a follow up question that I have, I do see you guys do. Um, I read recently in the New York Times that uh, there was a plan to control or take over the Colorado river water rights and what is done with those um is it the water rights does your plan um nobody's taking over colorado's water rights yeah. <laughs> the, I'm just that right say that now. the colorado river but no. not the rights no um so the fight right now is uh, the head of the cwcb which is the colorado water conservation board which is under the department of natural resources Becky Mitchell is our commissioner, and she is the watchdog, the bulldog, the fighter in the ring for our state with this whole discussion with the Bureau of Land Management yes. and what the upper basin states, which are Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Wyoming. The lower basin states are Nevada, Arizona, and California. And a hundred years ago, there was an arrangement, a compact made that the upper basin states will get 7.5 million acre feet a year to share, and so do the lower basin states, um, because California was growing faster than anybody else a hundred years ago. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so what's happened is, as I said at the beginning, the lower basin states had that checking account and they had that savings account and they have continually, year upon year upon year, used more than their 7.5 million acre feet. Colorado and the upper basin states have never used our allocated 7.5 <laughs> million acre feet. So, to, for the and so this is a little bit of a fight between the lower basin states and the upper basin states, saying, you know, you got to help us now, and we're saying we have lived within our means all of this time. We can show you how to do it, but you all have to get your house in order, and you all have to um, figure this out, and it's not gonna be easy. It's not gonna be easy. And so, just the other day, I went to another big water discussion, and Becky Mitchell was there, and so was somebody from the federal government. And she was saying that we should maybe even be encouraging the federal government to send a lot of that, re some of those resources to the lower basin states so they can fix the problem because we we don't have any more to give. We, we're, we're tapped out and we do need to protect our, our cities, our municipalities, and our agricultural industry is pushing $45 billion a year. It's like one of the biggest economic drivers of our state and agriculture needs 80 to 85 percent of the water of our state so we have got to um we can be compassionate but we've got to hang on to our water um because we have given more than we because we weren't using it so we let it go downstream i don't know that that, that totally answers But they are, they are deep in the middle of it I didn't understand and, that fight and just about. two weeks ago um so what did i say there were set there are seven states six of the seven states came to an agreement california. guess who was not <laughs> california the biggest so, so six of the seven states came to some kind of collaborative agreement to appease the bureau of land management and california did not so that's where we stand right now and um yeah okay great thank you <laughs> Great explanation. It's, it's rough. Uh, Kelsey, 
That was actually the question that I was going to ask, so I'll uh, ask a related one, which is... Who's Representative Crane? Ah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't I don't know who's going to answer that, <laughs> that question. But um, uh, as part of all of these apportionment discussions, it's my understanding that on the West Slope we have some reservations uh, for Native Americans that have never had a voice in the water allocations. Mm -hmm. And so how are we doing in terms of the water we keep? Are we being are we making progress on allocating that more fairly? I got it. So yeah. if you had listened to um, opening day at the state legislature, you would have heard for the very first time ever, the Ute Mountain Ute and the um, Southern Ute tribes leaders were invited to opening day at the General Assembly and they, they, they shouldn't need to be thankful, but they were very grateful because they are and, ha and recently have been always included and will continue to be included in our state government in this huge water discussion. So it is incredibly collaborative and I'm not sure you know when it stopped but it it is very much ongoing and involved and <coughs> anything that we do they're always a part of not just listening and being in the room but being part of the decision making process um, because the water of our state does not belong to us the use of the water belongs to us that's a very critical difference is the water in our state by law has to be put to beneficial use. And there are certain definitions for that. And so we don't own the water. People do own the right to use the water for certain uses. And the tribal nations, absolutely, the, the voice is just as equal as the rest of us in that discussion. And there's a large reservoir down in the southwest. The, mm -hmm. I just it's uh, Nightworth's reservoir, mm -hmm. and that's almost exclusively for their use. I think it does get used by Durango and a couple other local mm -hmm. municipalities, but that's that's the whole point. That they're part of that conversation for sure. So, any other questions or comments for anybody at this table? Well, I did. Uh, you know, I teach at Monarch High School in Louisville, and so. I uh, have a lot of colleagues and uh, uh, students that, and former students that lost their homes in the fire. And, and then I heard an NPR story, and that's why I brought this up about forest fire insurance coverage. And that really concerns me because, uh, you know, there's also many people out here that have mountain property and things like that, and they've done all they can to mitigate. My family cut out 200 trees on our property uh, just to make sure that we were doing the right thing and, and, and put gravel around just to make sure that, that you know, we had, had things done right there. But when you start to hear that some of the insurance companies are thinking about pulling out, uh, you know, that just, uh, and we hear about it from the point of view of, of uh, Florida. And now we're all supposed to be, the, you know, the state's supposed to be the backstop now. And, and I look at places like San Francisco where they have these huge, uh, uh, you know, skyscrapers that uh, is where they, they stored the money and, uh, and, you know, into property. Because, uh, and so, so in the end here, why is it that they get to continue to do normal course of business with, uh, with uh, doing cars and life insurance and everything else like that, <clears throat> but they get to pick and choose what they want, you know. And I think that's really got to stop. Do you mind? Um, if I, uh, oh, okay. oh! I was just going to tell. I was just going to talk a little about these bills. Oh, to do. well, I, I want to first answer, you know, Sean's question yeah. about how why are companies get to do that. So the exact same situation is going on with health insurance companies. That's why we had to do our basically reinsurance um, plan that we did a couple of years ago. Health insurance companies were picking the counties that they wanted to insure Coloradans in. And they would pick the ones where they could make the most money. And they were leaving these rural counties out of being covered. 
that's what the insurance home homeowners insurance companies are doing and uh, I don't know what it's going to take other than and Jennifer can go over part of Senator Fenberg's and Rebel Mobley's idea about helping homeowners I will tell you that we've put because of Marshall Fire we've put a lot of thought into more money and, and programs into mit mitigation to help property owners I'm running Senate Bill 5, which I think is com coming over to you. We have a desperate shortage of firefighters. We have one of the, the weakest workforce um, numbers for firefighters. And so uh, Senator Cutter and myself are running Senate Bill 5 so that we can get folks trained, identify young people that are interested in going into this, give them the training quickly, establish programs in the south of the state and up here, Front Range Community College right here in Longmont has one of the best programs around firefighting. And so how do we take that, again, that best practice and spread it to other areas of the state? And then we, of course, have um, detection. We're putting money into detecting fires faster. Yeah, exactly. and, and that I think is going to help a lot too. So we're kind of looking at this bigger. And then of course, what I talked about with housing, we've got to obviously do, do more for the folks that lost their homes. So, so just to let you know, um, to the Boulder County de delegation, I didn't know about Senator Fenberg, but for sure, Representative Ramabale is running a bill related to um, under insurance of homes and refusal to renew uh, or cancel insurance, particularly kind of focused on those areas in the in the buoy, as they say. You just learned that term. I just learned that term. That, that stands for <laughs> wildland urban, urban in, uh, interface. Inter interface. Yeah. 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 So these these homes that are that are on the edge of, of where we see a lot of wildfires. Or not. Or not. Right. not. Yeah. Um, that is House Bill 23-1174. It is currently scheduled to be heard this week in Business Affairs and Labor, so I would encourage you to read it and, uh, and, and comment on it uh, if, uh, if, if you, you know, support or want to look at it. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is has a little bit to do with, with the water negotiations. Uh, and a little bit to do with the climate crisis, and that is uh, that our reservoirs are low, not just me and Powell, but some of the ones uh, higher up in the runoff, uh, which, which puts our ability to generate hydroelectric power at risk. Is there um, anything going on that's going to help with regulating discharge flow so that we can keep? Not a thing. Not that that, that's that's the whole it, because it's a holistic system, mm -hmm. um, and so even the power generated at Lake Powell <coughs> comes to Tri-State, right. and it's at it's the, the, what is the number thirty-five twenty-five, like it is at thirty-five thirty, like it is so critical right now mm -hmm. that. Um, and, and even the fact that the water pressure that typically is above that is causing a 25% reduction in the ability for hydropower because it's not pushing hard enough. Um, and, and so the things that are happening upstream, there are releases being made, the kind of emergency releases from, you know, I talked about the checking account and the I mean, yeah, checking savings. Well, we're the credit card up here. <laughs> and so we're having to release um, certain amounts of water from our reservoirs to go downstream to protect Lake Powell. Because if that fails, we're all in a world of hurt. So, and we're very thankful and hopeful that the snowpack this year is, is giving us a little bump, but this is a long-term <coughs> problem. You know, they're not calling this a 20-year drought anymore. They're calling us in a period of drying and arid aridification. Like we're just getting hotter and drier. And so we, we cannot plan for drought and then wet years and drought. You know, we have to plan 
for um, what the reality of what we're in. And so that that is happening there, and the, the federal government people are looking at this minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, and and turning faucets on where they can. Well, then, one, one of the things I was going to add to Karen's fantastic description um, about what's happening with water is it was the, the crisis of generating the energy that triggered the federal government to jump in and say, okay, that's it. We're not waiting for you to get, this, get these to get together and come up with a plan anymore. And they actually said, if it gets to the, there's like a, there's color zoning yeah. of where the energy is, and if it gets to a certain level, they're just gonna, they're not, they're not gonna wait in California, they're not gonna wait for ours. They're just gonna step in and say, this is what is going to happen. Because we have to, we're relying on this for our energy. Yeah, yeah and so we're trying to say, we wanna make, we do want local control decisions. And we want to be in charge of our decisions. We don't want federal government and BLM to come in and say, here's the plan, yeah. take it or leave it, but you have to take it. So that's why we were trying to get together with the other states and say, we've got to come up with a plan or we're not going to like what we're told to do. And, and there won't be any negotiating. So we're still in that phase. Well, I'm glad that you're so well informed on it, at least. I've learned a lot. Yeah. This is like we, as a general assembly as a, expert on I'm not, I'm not. I'm like, it's two years <laughs> when you serve. I, I, I feel like I'm in, I mean, it's the first water. grade of water. Water. <laughs> water. Well, you know, I was in kindergarten last year, first grade. This year. When it's you were running in CD4, where there is no water ever, yeah, that's true. you started on water law then. I remember that. So, okay. It's fascinating. Work. It really is fascinating. Yeah, I know. Yeah. If I can say one more thing about knowledge and expertise, our Boulder County delegation is superb. You've got people that are stepping up and looking at water. You know, I do a lot for housing and health care. Jennifer is doing a lot for all kinds of areas around ethics and mm -hmm. it, it, it's keeping kids safe at school. Just, just for, and then you've got the president of the Senate. We've got um, Judy and Mobley working on mental health. I mean, it's just, it's an amazing, diverse delegation. And I, I feel really lucky that I'm part of a team that is representing Boulder County. Because we're, I don't know, I think we're doing all right. So, great. Thank you. All of you. Mm -hmm. I feel more secure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we are at the public invited to be heard or the public comment section. So let's get started with that. And the first person, you have three minutes, just like normal, uh, normal council time. George Tristan is the first one on our list. And we don't have a microphone, George, so um, speak loud. Speak loud. Yeah. I can do that. I know you can. <laughs> Where should I? Wherever you want. Um, maybe on the, the side, then we can, you know, over on this side, and then the, everybody can hear and see you. Sounds good. Uh, my name is George Tristan. I live at 1703 Whitehall Drive. America was built on the backs of people who aspire to do great things. This nation, after all, is known the world over as a land of opportunity, where anyone who sets forth to work hard, invest in their future, make difficult sacrifices, and dream big, could one day realize the heralded American dream. Before COVID, there was hope in our country. Unemployment was at record lows for nearly every working age demographic. Wages were rising dramatically after decades of stagnation. Personal retirement investment plans were seeing dramatic gains, and the key economic indicator referred to as the gross domestic product was steadily indicating that the sound fiscal policies of the free market were paying off in handsome dividends. Today, sadly, many people are experiencing real economic hardship. The current levels of credit card debt can be compared to the catastrophic 2008 housing collapse. Families are spending on average $8,500 more on everyday living experiences than prior to COVID. To understand the root cause, we can merely apply Economics 101. The Biden administration has mismanaged the bank account, writing checks that future generations will be burdened to reconcile. 
The generation of mass amounts of debt simply has had the natural effect of lowering the value of the dollar, undermining our purchasing power. The trillions of dollars that are being spent by this administration were propagandized to the, pub to the American public as infrastructure projects or under the guise of inflation reduction. However, the truth is that we have been sold a bill of goods. Most of the money allocated in these bills have gone towards the funding of political ideologies that are transforming life in America. The most nefarious of these dogmas is social justice, which has instituted judicial reforms that have resulted in increased crime in our communities. Equity-based legislation has purposely elevated segments of our population perceived as underrepresented or disadvantaged. Legislators like, legislators like Representative McCormick have sponsored or supported bills underpinned by this woke ideology we call equity. Supporters believe that Americans who have achieved who have achieved generational economic prosperity have done so due to privilege. That those who have achieved the American dream should feel shame for having achieved success. Essentially, <coughs> meritocracy is being replaced with equity, meaning that reward is no longer earned through hard work and sacrifice. Rather, it is given to those who possess immutable characteristics rooted in their racial or gender identity. Is this the landscape we want to leave our children and grandchildren? Will we no longer pass on the sage advice of get a good education, make sacrifices, work hard, have respect for the law, and you will achieve success? I suggest that victimization and identity politics are lowering the standard of living for the true dreamers who sadly someday may never dream again. Thank you, George. Thank you. Mary Goodman. No class. Let's go. and children. Okay, great. Because that's one of the things that I stand up for in our communities and our nation. Okay. And there's something in our flag that has a statement, liberty and justice for all. And our children is standing under transgender, transgender in the school systems, not to judge transgender people, because I can't do that because of what I work for. Mm -hmm. But I can fight for what they're doing in the school systems by brainwashing the children. You know, um, I have heard a story uh, just last week in another state where a six-year-old was raped by a transgender on a school bus. Where are we at? Where, where are the children heard? Children need to be heard. They have rights too. And we adults are fighting each other and not listening to children. Where are we at in this nation? The other topic is about our police officers are out there fighting for their lives because you have dumb people out there not just breaking into cars. They got fentanyl and now we got the zombie drug out there. What are we going to do about that in our communities? You know, our kids, the youth, the youth are being destroyed by all this because of the borders are open. What are we going to do about Colorado? You know, the, these things are eating up our youth. And I'm standing up for that. Nobody is listening to the young people at all. The adults are fighting each other, pointing fingers at each other, and not listening to the youth. Not listening to the young people at all. And all these crimes out there, police officers can go out there and make an arrest and have to let that person go. 
because why? Because that police officer went and touched the person, trying to make an arrest, and that person makes a complaint, and they get released. So what? How are we going to fight these laws? That's the question that I have in this committee. So we don't usually answer or interact with public comment, but uh, we do have, and I, and I don't think that our public safety chief, Zach Artis, um, there is one statement that you made about um, people being arrested and being released. It isn't necessarily because they touched someone. It, it is. It um, is. It, it is. <clears throat> Not I always. See it. I've <laughs> seen it out there okay. because that, that person calls out an officer racism when it's not racism. Okay. The person is calling out, oh, I can't breathe. In some cases, it is that. But other Great. cases, it is not. Thank you so much for your comments. What's um, your name? Uh, yes, yeah, you, you are. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, what's your name? Because you didn't say Mary. Mary. Oh, Mary. Mary. Good. Mary. Good. Mary. Good. Okay. It's good that I'll be happy to talk to you after this. Yes. We can talk to you some other time. But our laws need to be changed. And, and Zach yeah, is definitely the one to talk they to. They need to be enforced and changed. Again, and Tuesday night. And when I can this. Okay. Oh, good. You made the right decision about where to get into politics. <laughs> Good evening. Excuse my voice. I'm Antoinette Kemper. Observing the legislation being proposed and passed by our state government, it's clear the trend is to regu regulate more and more aspects of our daily life while stripping authority from our local governments. Take, for example, House Bill 23-1057, Amenities for All Genders in Public Buildings, which establishes requirements for non-gender restrooms in public buildings. As you know, the bill cites International Plumbing Code or IPC requirements that prohibit single stall restrooms from being from being designated for use by any specific gender, and direct multi stall restrooms be provided for the for use by any gender if certain IPC facility features are met. While there is a small percentage of the population who legitimately legitimately need single stall non gendered restrooms. The numbers do not justify prohibiting gender-specific sing single-stall restrooms. And I don't know anyone who would be comfortable using non-gendered multi-stall restrooms. But more importantly, I question why a plumbing code would address how bathrooms are gendered. In the case of non-gendered restrooms, the IPC isn't setting a plumbing standard, but a social standard. House Bill 23-1057 uses the terminology the IPC requires, but the IPC is a model code intended to be adopted and amended to refl reflect local practices and laws. These standards are a guide, not a requirement. Colorado is one of 37 states that adopted the IPC. The IPC is under the International Code Council, or ICC. The ICC is not a regulatory agency and it has no regulatory authority. It's a nonprofit organization with corporate sponsors. The question is, why are we surrendering our authority to this unelected entity? Our city staff is perfectly capable of planning construction projects to meet the needs of Longmont. And as we all know, every construction code has a price tag attached to it, which is paid by the people. According to the ICC website, the International Code and ICC standards are developed through a World Trade Organization compliant, consensus-based process that is supported and embraced by the U.S. government. The ICC's so-called Family of Solutions, of which the IPC is part of, support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as laid out in Agenda 2030. So, our state and federal governments have aligned themselves with the globalists to the detriment of the people they serve. We do not consent. Thank you. Thank you, Internet. Mark Milliman. Oh, it was. Picked him up.
Hi, I'm Mark Melliman. I'm going to be speaking extemporaneously tonight. I was going to talk about our misguided and failed energy policy and how it's hurting the people of this community, driving investment away. I actually made an investment decision based upon some new legislation being proposed to move it out of state because it will be unaffordable to do here, or to talk about why uh, uh, municipalities in the state should not be getting into the broadband business at, based on my 30 some odd years experience. So instead, I'm gonna be talking about the mental health crisis that you people have created for our children. And I speak from the heart on this one, because I've personally experienced it. Um, our parental rights have been eroded continuously over the last sessions, and the new HB uh, 23, 1003, I believe, on the mental, school mental health assistance um, assessments if that bill was in place a couple years ago, I would not have a daughter today. Okay. Because I would have been not, excuse me. <laughs> you can do it, Mark. It's a little bit hard. You can do it, buddy. Because I'm exposing something in public I've been keeping fairly private for quite a while. But um, I feel it must be said because our mental health system in this county and in places are broken. And I know all of the resources. I've been deeply involved in this for the last three, four years of my life. Okay, I was denied access to my daughter's uh, health records, and even access to die, uh, denied access to her for a while. She was assaulted sexually and physically in mental health facilities in this county, Centennial Peaks. Okay, Dora does nothing about it. There's other facilities she's been assaulted by males that she was housed with and uh, that were covered up and we could not prosecute in another jurisdiction because of these bills. As a parent, I took complete 100% control of my daughter's mental health because I found out that not only are these places that we supposedly trust are dangerous, they're incompetent as well. About a third of mental health professionals are harmful to children. The other third are incompetent. We have maybe a third that are decent at it. Okay, and if our rights are continuously eroded through 1003 and other things uh, that are coming up that we've just uh, been told about tonight uh, by a senator that could not uh, grace us with her presence tonight. I know Rob would have been here, but uh, that's another story. Uh, what senator? Huh? What senator? What senator? Uh, for SD 15? I don't think she was invited. Oh, she was? Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, like I said, you know, we as parents need to have uh, the rights to access our children's medical records. We need to know what's happening at the schools. I would have lost my daughter at a public school, okay? And wasn't for, uh, at that point in time, I had to fight through the courts. She was under the control of other people as well as somebody who was um, potentially trafficking her and who was DoorDash for drugs in Boulder County. He only sold to children. And he was allowed out on low bail and uh, through the system. Now fortunately, through the great work of our poorly underfunded Longmont Police Department, did an awesome job and with the DA who stacked up up to 59 charges against this individual and has a $2 million cash bail on his head, as well as the other co-conspirators, hopefully we, he will never see the light of day again. But we all know he's already been replaced, okay? So uh, I know my time is probably oh, about up no, here. So what I wanna say is that you guys continue to take our rights away and make it more difficult for us to raise our children. These are our children, not yours, not the schools, not the state stars. Right. Thank you. Thank right. you, Mark. Steve Alshon. Her name? No, I'm oh, sorry. It's sorry. It's Steve. Good evening. My name is Steve Altshuler. I live at 1555 Taylor Drive. I want to quote from a bestseller book. It's been a bestseller for years and years. This might just ring a bell. Give a man a fish and he eats for a day. Teach a man how to fish and he eats for a lifetime. Giving to the needy only enables them to do nothing. Making them work helps their self-esteem and it helps the whole community. A lot of the bills I'm hearing you talk about tonight 
are just helping people that you think need help. You're not, you're enabling them. Kick them in the butt and tell them to start working for themselves. I spent 35 years working 60 hours a week. I live on social security and a little bit of income from a couple of rentals. And last couple of years during the uh, COVID, the state was saying, oh, you don't have to pay your rent because of COVID. Well, I got lucky, my renters did pay me. But if they hadn't, I could have lost my house. So where is all your care for the people that are working for a lifetime rather than the people that are just trying to get by on freebies? So I want to talk about landlord's rights. I, have a, I had a rental in Westminster. And about three years ago, there was a lady that was not paying her rent. I told her she had to leave. So the day they left, she didn't fight me on leaving, but the day they left, they left the shower on, they put a towel in the strainer, so the shower overflowed. I had about $4,500 of damage in my unit. The lady down the, downstairs had over $100,000. An 85-year-old lady had to live in a hotel for six or eight weeks while the insurance company redid her entire unit. Stop thinking that renters are this poor, mishandled, abused people and that landlords are mean. There's a lot of renters that are disgusting, okay? I just had one person leave. He's been there for 14 years. He was fantastic. It's not always that way. In the same unit I'm talking about a moment ago with the other lady, after I cleaned my unit all up, I had someone else move in there. This lady convinced me to let her son stay there who was a little bit mentally handicapped, but she convinced me that he was stable and responsible and working and she would be there every day to make sure things went well. The first thing he did was let six illegal Mexicans live in there with him from his work. And when I went through, he kicked them out. The police came and said, you can't do that. I said, it says on the lease, he's not allowed to have anybody else in here. And they said, that's a civil matter. Legally, you can't kick them out. So I had to take them to court. It took three or four months to get them out. They had written with ink on every wall they had burnt wax into the carpeting. They had tore some doors off the cabinetry. And that cost me $5,500 to repair. So my point is, quit thinking that the needy people have to be supplemented. Let them work and support people that are working and providing for our community. And by the way, when I sold that unit, I moved up to Weld County instead of Longmont because I didn't want to be in socialist Boulder County with a rental property. Thank you. Mike Sandoval. Hello, Mike Sandoval. I'm at 242 East Mountain View Avenue. Um, I've been a resident of Walmart for 46 years, and I had a property for 30 years, been paying property tax for 30 years. Um, I had a rental property, I um, rented it to a, a gay woman. Um, she moved in, she was um, um, a manager at some of these restaurants, uh, carry-off restaurants. Um, and then I think during COVID, she broke up with her girlfriend and then she relapsed. And then there was some, um, um, I have a renter on top, she was living in the basement. Uh, the renter on top had five kids, two autistic. Uh, one of them had feeding tube. Anyway, their kids were complaining that they were having headaches and feeling nauseous. So they called the cops. Uh, the cops went downstairs, uh, they knocked on the door, the tenant didn't open the door, so the cops came back up and said, there's nothing we can do. They did that 30 times, okay? So eventually the mom, she, we got a warrant, the person got arrested, she had uh, possession of three grams of meth, and uh, basically she was, uh, the judge uh, basically put her in jail for like three weeks and three hundred dollars bond. She was released during COVID, I could not evict her, but she went back into the property and she had some other homeless people there. Um, but uh, when I did evict her, I tested the property and it was positive for meth. And it was the, uh, I tested the basement, there was a furnace in the basement that was breathing air up through the upstairs. So both the basement and the upstairs were positive for meth. The tenant upstairs, a single dad with five kids, he was, had the code said get rid, of, get rid of him. So I did, and he was kind of homeless. The city did find a place for him to live, but you know, he, he was homeless. Uh, basically, I went through the testing part of it, um, 
and, uh, and then I did the mitigation. I had followed the rules exactly, and it cost me like fifty-three thousand dollars out of my pocket. Uh, the tenant who was smoking, she basically just got her hands slapped. She's probably in jail right now, but she pays nothing. Um, I went to the insurance company and said, "Hey, uh, can you help me with rent? Can you help me mitigate this property?" They canceled me. Okay, so basically it was all on me. So I'm, I'm going to go to a, there was a former mayor out of San Jose. He said, jail should not punish people for just for using drugs. Lengthy incarceration won't help. Rather, we must use the criminal justice system strategically to promote behavioral change for people who use drug use and threaten public safety. Okay, these people do have mental health. My tenant, her dad was an alcoholic. He died when she was young. Her mom was like 30 years old, couldn't take care of her kid, gave up on her kids. So she, the tenant, I don't know, she went to found homeless people and she got hooked on drugs. So yes, she had mental health problems and I was trying to help her. Um, so basically, what I'm saying right now, the legal action is to help people using drugs. People who have residences, that's why I'm here. I need a plan to protect the residential property of users. Um, I'll say I'm a, back on a pharmacy too. Methamphetamine, amphetamine, it's close to amphetamine, it's Adderall, it helps in narcolepsy, ADHD, and obesity. Meth, I think you just add carbon and three hydrogens to it but it's more of a different chemical now, okay? Um, amph amphetamine is uh, prescribed to three to five-year-old kids and the dose 2.5 milligrams to 40 milligrams today. Uh, my meth, the people who, person who tested my property said Walmart is a headbed, is a hotbed for meth, okay? So people are coming here. Um, Mike, my, can you just wrap it up? Okay, yes. wrap it up. Yep. Uh, the laws I would like to see right here, um, meth, is the laws are saying that the labs, the labs are contaminated. They do, they will kill people. But if someone smoking meth is just amphetamine, okay? So I'm saying that's not as toxic as, as it should be, but let's separate labs from people who smoke. So let's separate that, okay? And um, I'm also saying, can insurance companies help residential users, okay? And, um, I'm also looking at the, I'm following the rules. So testing and mitigating, I paid property taxes for 30 years and my taxes are being used for other purposes. Why can't I use my property taxes to me to help test and mitigate my property? And it ain't only me, everybody who owns property in Longmont, they say they had a party, a Christmas party, a birthday party, and their friend's friend or husband or wife or someone's friend come in and smoke meth when they want to sell their property, they just ruined their property. And I know a person who was a senior citizen. It cost, um, she was a former president of a my, bank. My, I see uh, Senator Marquez Lewis there making tens of notes. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I I'm going gonna, gonna to give you a, a bill that is getting ready to be passed that will help you with the meth situation. So I'll give you my card. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Marianne Nijos. My name is Marianne Niehaus and I live at 762 Stonebridge. I'd like to read a little something. Um, Dear Globalists, we the people reviewed your proposal for the Great Reset and we regret to inform you that we will have to decline at this time. Although we did not, we did find the free trial of the NWO very interesting we have decided instead to go with the great American waking. Sincerely, the human race. I don't know about you guys, but uh, there's a lot going on here. And we have uh, the people, we have the power. Um, can I ask a quick question? No? You can ask, but we're not going to respond. Okay. okay. Does anyone have an opinion here? Okay. On anything. We all do have opinions. That's what we're here. We're sharing our opinions. And um, does anybody have a choice? We have a choice here. Okay. So my question is, how many of you are familiar with the Constitution? Okay. So we know that we, the people of the United States of America, have rights. And what's happening is we 
choose you. We choose the politicians, right? We're supposed to have legal voting. We're supposed to have machines that don't cheat. And that is our right. That's what we are here for is the Constitution. And so what I want to say is, I don't want non-gender bathrooms. I don't. How many of you have sat in a stall with a man next to you doing his business? I don't care how many fancy clothes you're wearing, you're still a man. Transgender restrooms is ridiculous. We have family restrooms. Why don't we have a family restroom then you can be a transgender and go in there and do your business privately. But I don't want my four-year-old standing in a bathroom next to a little boy with his penis hanging out going to the bathroom. I'm sorry. I just won't stand for that. And you know what? I don't have to because I'm a citizen of the, I am a, we the people of the United States of America and we have a constitution. And these laws that are being shoved down my throats, these gun laws, these gender laws, I'm here to tell you right now my opinion. This stupid crisis stuff is a bunch of BS. If you guys flipped open the page, you would see that these globalists are creating all these crises with water and our air and our soils and our farmers. They're creating the crisis and then they're trying to convince you that you have to support their crisis through the WEF. So my opinion is that we're all citizens of the United States of America. I have a constitution, I have a passport, and that's what gives me the right to stand up here and tell you that we're putting everybody on notice here. These poor people that are here, that are talking about these crises and health, health and, and just like this gentleman, you know, the health crisis of our children is being created by this globalist atmosphere that you have to decide at three years old if you're a boy or a girl. What so, the heck? I heard, I saw a guy go in Marianne, to- Marianne, I'm, I'm sorry, oh. maybe three minutes early. Oh, am I already? Gosh, <laughs> yeah. um, but, I think but I said everything I wanted to say. We, well, we did hear you. Um, perhaps you could get uh, cards or email them what, exactly what you would like our legislators and senators to do. Okay. I think that would be a good. All right. And I, I'm sure they heard you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Vincent. Why are we allowing these clauses? Oh, yes. We really don't know. It's totally awesome. Good evening. I'm Tara Menza, 2235 Parkview Drive. Every day in Longmont, people are affected by crime. They get their car, catalytic converters, and bikes stolen. They are too afraid to go out of their house after dark because of the revolving door criminals and rampant crime in their neighborhoods. Longmont Public Safety's hands are tied by all the social justice legislative reforms that have been passed these last couple of years. Longmont is suffering, and our elected representatives, who claim to listen to us and represent us, are too busy pushing an extreme liberal agenda instead of helping keep Longmont safe. The utmost basic aspect of good governance is safety. Yet in 2021, Representative McCormick, you co-sponsored the misdemeanor reform bill, a bill that has coddled criminals, allowed deadly drugs such as fentanyl to flow through our community, and has left victims vulnerable, as you've heard. This bill ties the hands of the judicial branch by changing sentencing guidelines and lowering penalties for crimes, allowing up to one gram of fentanyl and four grams of other hard drugs to be just a misdemeanor. This soft on crime liberal agenda is hurting Longmont and Colorado. Representative McCormick, per your own website, you want to focus on addressing climate change, lowering health care, education, cost of living, systemic racism, inequities, LGBTQ rights, reproductive rights, housing, and then you mentioned safety. These priorities are rooted in an agenda that results in putting people's lives in your own community at risk versus increasing much needed public safety. As one of your constituents, I find it appalling that you're busy sponsoring legislation that takes away legal gun owners right to shoot a gun on their own property in unincorporated Boulder County and sponsoring legislation that will cap the rent in Longmont, which will effectively reduce the rental property inventory and sponsoring legislation that will ensure boys and girls together can use a multi-cell bathroom in any public building instead of helping to reduce crime right here in Longmont. We need an ultra tough on crime. We need ultra tough on crime bills to slow the progression of crime-related events in our community and state. I am offended that you choose to focus on sexuality and gender instead of protecting our children and families from crime, violence, and drugs. 
In December of 2022, there was a very dangerous person with ties to the Sinaloa cartel who was out of jail on bond and detained in Longmont and charged with unlawful possession and distribution of fentanyl. That criminal's bond was set at a mere $500,000. The amount of fentanyl and cocaine he was peddling weighed nearly 45 pounds, enough to kill over a million people. This is a direct result of your bill. Additionally, one of the unintended consequences of your misdemeanor reform bill was that it decriminalized gun ownership for tens of thousands of felons, including those convicted of drug dealing, organized crime, burglary, arson, car theft, I could go on. As a team leader for the League of Women Voters Gun Safety Team, I think this was a great mistake. I hear you now sponsoring bills to fix the bad bills you created. With Democrats in full control of the governor's mansion and the state capitol for the last 10 years, what impact have they had in improving our quality of life? Well, Colorado ranks highest in the nation in many distinguishable categories, such as auto theft, fentanyl overdoses, and teen suicide. I respectfully submit this is the result of years of failed policies coming out of the capitol that have irreparably harmed Coloradans across our state. When is enough, enough. Elected representatives at the table, you can stop the insanity. I implore you to repeal the misdemeanor reform bill as a first step to bringing safety back to our communities and start sponsoring more tough on crime bills that will protect Walmart. Thank you, Tara. <laughs> Marley I know. Oh, Marley's Levitch. I I hope I pronounced that right. We're coming really close in my my soul. Okay, I cannot speak that loud. But I'm going to talk about something completely different. Okay, I'm talking, oh, I'm getting goosebumps to just starting to talk about it. I'm talking about some uh, causes and how we can change all, well, everything that has been going on. And it's because we took God and the, the, the divine out of our schools, out of our education, out of all of the decision making. If we all learn, as I've been practicing, with the global healing group all around this world. It doesn't matter what skin color, what uh, ethnic group, what belief system. They're Muslims, they're Christians, they're from all over, and they love each other. And we are praying and actually asking and asking God, <laughs> all of us, because we know it's the same creator for everyone, because we are children of God. And we are not just bodies, we are spirit, and spirit is within each of us. So what do we do? We can just learn, and, and, and I want to commend you because I would never be able or would want to take a job like you do. Because I applaud you for that, really, and I admire that. And I know you have good intentions, but we have to look at the cause. And if we come together, what our founding fathers have done, that's what I left about it, one nation under God. I mean, if we've that taken God out of it, fathers. what do we have? We no longer, and we have not had a nation. Not for a long, long time. How can we call it a nation? And all we do is wage war all over the world. And we are paying for it as citizens, right? Or just, just working here. So I really, I would implore you and ask you, learn to also practice at home and also coming together in meetings where you pray but sincerely not just words but feel it and ask god sincerely and ask the divine or allow whatever you want to call our creator but it's the same and when we start going within instead of looking all all the problems that's why we have all these problems these children don't even know that they are spirit, that this is not just their body, that it's a, that is only part of it. God has given us this body as a gift, so we want to take good care of it, but we are also made stewards of our earth. So what have we done? We have created just uh, toxins and poison everywhere. <clears throat> Why do we have uh, fluoride in this water? That's another way to save money instead of killing people with the water. Why do we all have to, you know, make all of them? This doesn't look very nice, but that helps protect you against all the radiation. I'm very, very sensitive to all the radiation, the EMF. And now you even want to roll out our, you know, the 5G and the smart leader programs. That's killing more people. 
because I know how to protect myself. 90% of the people don't. So I've been passionate about holistic health, natural healing. Why don't you support that? I'm turning 80 this year, right? So I'm happy. I don't use one drug, I never would. If it, if, it, if it helps me, if it helps me, I'm happy. And I'm grateful for our medical doctors and, and, and those because I bet it's your accident. Bonnie. Okay, thank you. No, thank you very much for this advice. <laughs> Rob Brandenburg, Grandpa's farm, 104 Ninth Avenue here in town. Been here 33 years. Sorry, I was like that piece of here that for eight years. And grandpa's for 24 years now. Next month, I'll be around for 29 years. I bought from a cop. So, Public safety is pretty damn important. I think it's being swept up right here. So, share a few stories with you. Marlena King, during uh, COVID, on film, she couldn't break into our front door, so she decided to bust out a bunch of windows. It cost me $2,000. But because we couldn't get the plexiglass, couldn't get the glass, I failed to submit these receipts on time, so that was two grand out of my pocket. Marlena King, Boulder, Colorado, assaulted two people in their home. When the cops showed up, punched out both cops. Real sweet person. Revolving door criminal. Another individual, I can't remember his name right now. Um, we had a $700 mountain bike sold in front of our store. We're over here off 9th Avenue. Used bolt cutters to cut the cable, broad daylight. $700 mountain bike. 20 minutes after he stole that one, stole one from Easy Pond, $500. Now this SOB is 40 years old and has been behind bars 21 years. I caught him trying to steal a bike out of this. Took a swing at me with a pair of bolt cutters, <laughs> got five felony assault charges on him. They were all dropped. He was, uh, had stolen 60 cars in Long Island. It was given a year and a half. So that's, tell you what, if you don't get tough on crime, crime will get tough on you. Right. Right. <clears throat> and I feel sorry for these cops. <clears throat> they need to be supported more. And our prosecutors need to start having some damn mandatory prosecutions. Last one I'm gonna share with you, Roxana Aguilar, August 5th, 2020. Stole an $80,000 pickup in Westminster, came up here. Try to break into Bright Bison Arms at 4 30 in the morning. Couldn't get in. Came to our place at 5 30. Couldn't get in for an hour and a half. Broke some windows as they left, stole a bunch of tools that they could reach anywhere. She then traveled over to the post, the chicken restaurant here in town. Used an axe to break into the building. Used an axe to break into the office. And this big goon that was with her carried out a three or four hundred pound safe. Driven back to the stolen pickup. They came back over our place. They ran through my west wall. And some of you know it's a cinder block building, mm -hmm. reinforced with rebar and concrete. It's not easy to get into. And the stolen $80,000 pickup broke into our place, stole 12 guns. She was charged with over 40 felonies at our place. Now, she also broke into her dogs four days before. So she broke into four businesses in four days. She broke into seven gun stores in a month. August 2020, approximately December 2021. I'm sorry, your, your time is up, but I think that we get it. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Roxanne only stole 50 cars in one month and over 200 on the front range. I'll tell you what, a $200 misdemeanor ticket is BS. When I grew up, most of you guys, Grand Theft Auto was a ticket to the penitentiary. Right. And it ain't even a misdemeanor anymore. It's a $200 for your ticket. Not a slap on the hand. We have a couple more people that want okay. to talk. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I work six days a week. I welcome you to stop by. Thank and you. I didn't get to talk about the rape victims. 
Cinnamon Kitchen. Yeah. You're good? Yes, yeah, so I thought we were signing in. So oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, and you're Jennifer. Hi, everybody else. Oh. I'm Jennifer. You're welcome. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I don't think that's a good idea. No, I said, no. You've had your three minutes and three minutes more. Uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Yeah. They're clapping at us. Um, so it's fun. Thank you. You can hire back your fire department people. You know, the ones that were, were let go out there in the back seats. So thank you everybody for uh, coming and your remarks were heard, your comments were heard. Uh, our police department, our representatives are working on the laws that you mentioned. Uh, and we're very aware and have been with our staff and the police department talking about these laws and how we can get, we're aware. I'm sorry that our city is is going through well, this. Well, there's a lot of cities that are- There are a lot, I get it. But thank you but very it's gotta much. it's got to get better. It is going to get better. It's trying. It is going to get better.